So, um, today we are going to talk about. Oh, in the box. Today we are going to talk about chapter 13, which is <clears throat> urban planning and solid waste management. Okay, so urbanization and solid and hazardous waste management. So why is this important? Well, why is this important? Well, it's because most of our people now live in urban areas. So if we're going to make a difference, we've already decided in this class, it's the social side of things that really happens. So we need to focus in how we can help the people be more sustainable and have a better quality of life, okay? So today, 52% of the world's people live in urban areas, and that includes 82% if you're in the U.S. So, you know, this is combining all the very third world countries where people tend to live outside of the cities, but that's changing very fast, okay? The people that are moving to cities is growing very fast. By, so by 2050, expect that 62% of people will actually live in the cities. Okay, and we'll have 26 mega cities. I don't even want to visit a mega city, okay? The whole concept scares me half to death, right? And poverty, we'll have at least one billion living in shanty towns. How many of you have actually ever had the opportunity to actually be in a true shanty town? Yeah, how did what's that? A sh what's a shanty town? Yeah, good, good question. Explain. Explain, describe what you would call a, a shanty town. Um, I think mine is more of like a slum. Slum, yes. Yeah. We used to call them slums. Yeah, okay. basically like small tin houses, and like very packed together, dirty, um, yeah, lack of hygiene, lack of medical care. Comes from the word shanty, which was just a thrown so together building. The desert, they have like underground burrows right here. Well, they do have a little bit here, but when we talk shanty town, if you go, and we'll see a picture of one right now in Rio, but basically you got the city, and this is very clear where I just came from in South Africa, and then right next door, in a little open area, up against the freeway, people living literally in cardboard houses, or piece of metal put up, or anything that they can salvage. So there's no infrastructure. A slum is more, hey, there used to be infrastructure, there were houses there, there were apartments, there might be a sewerage system, there might be a bit of a transportation system. So in South Africa this last time, they were having a demonstration in one of these shanty towns, and the only place they could go to demonstrate was to spill right out into one of the major freeways. So they closed the whole dang freeway. Um, so it's just a complete, utter mess. And we're looking at one, peop one billion people living like that. So how many do we have? 7.4 going on to 8, and we've got 1 billion of them living under those conditions. So that's a huge problem. Can't expect that to be sustainable. Okay, so this is that picture. I think we've seen some of this already. Looking at the lights at night, my favorite thing. Why is it that we even have to leave the lights on? But apart from that, that shows you where the lights, the people are living, right? Where these mega cities are, where people are concentrated, because they're all, I guess the moral of the story is they're all in the same place, wasting a lot of energy, I don't know. But anyway, that's me just being a little negative, okay? So population shift from 1800 to 20, 20, 2012, rural people moved towards the cities, mostly to look for, uh, look for jobs, Large central cities move to smaller cities. That's suburbia. That, we've got the greatest example of that. We are suburbia for the LA Basin, right? People, people moved into this area so that they would have cheaper living and, and they make that amazing commute all the way down into the valley, into LA sometimes. From north to east and south to west, totally understandable to me in the United States, who would learn to live in the north with all the mosquitoes, or in the east with all the humidity, perfect reason to move. <laughs> Cities and suburbs to developed rural areas. And we're going to talk about this in a moment. 
the rural areas have become very developed. And we're going to talk about a thing called urban sprawl. Okay? So that's what it looks like on a map for the United States, where all the people um, want to live and do live. And if you noticed, it's showing all the way up to us here, into the Mojave here, we're considered a population's density zone, right? We don't really think of that like that necessarily. We think of up here being more rural, and it, fortunately it still kind of is, but we have a lot of people in a fairly small space, okay? Um, so urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is this idea that we all want to live on a slightly bigger piece of land, and, and locally here in the Mojave, we can do that. We can go out of town and we can buy a bigger piece of land. So I could move from effectively a one-acre piece of land, and I could move to where, where we are now. You guys saw that. And I've got seven and a half acres. And that seems cool, and that seems like, oh, well, that's not urbanization. That's not urban sport. But really, we're taking, we're concentrating people out in the rural areas, and it has effects. It, 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 and we're going to go over those in a mo mo moment. What, what does urban sprawl co cause when we all move out? It has effects, and, it, and there's unsustainable parts of that. It's great for my lifestyle, but there's, there's issues. So why do you move affordable land, automobiles, cheap gasoline in the past, right? We could drive, and little or no urban planning. It's a huge issue, right? Used to be you could just go live wherever you like, put up a, like you're talking about, put up a shack, live underground, Sam, or whatever these people are doing. But, you know, now you can't do that. The county's going to show up and they're going to say, hey, what's going on here? Do you, have a, do you have a building permit for those shipping containers you have or whatever you put up there? And, you know, slowly, slowly, those areas do get cleaned up, right? Not always as quickly as you'd like. Basically takes normally somebody to complain about it, unfortunately. Okay, okay. natural capital degradation. If we're looking at this thing of urban sprawl, what does it cause? Loss of cropland. Loss and fragmentation of grass, forest, grassland, wetlands, and wildlife habitat. That's one of the effects we see here. Okay, so let's say in my area, the one I'd like to try to think about is the roadrunner. Roadrunners have a very big uh, uh, habitat area. Um, what's the word I'm trying to look territory. for? Territory. Thank you very much. They have a big territory, and they like to move around. They're inquisitive, and they like to go steal somebody's dog food over at this house and somebody's cat food over at that house. And then there's lots of local people that feed them chicken bones and, and all that kind of stuff. But the more places they are in between on their routes and on their thing, it breaks it up. So that's one example. The bighorn sheep, they need to migrate. They traditionally, we're pretty sure, used to migrate from the Lucerne Valley Mountains here, migrate out into the Mojave. Well, the moment we put in the town of Lucerne Valley, we put up renewable energy, we put up houses, we put up roads, we now know that this little population of up to 40 bighorn sheep that live almost in our backyard up here um, doesn't cross Highway 18. So you know how Highway 18 goes up to Big Bear? They don't cross that. So that's an example of urban sprawl, people moving out where we've now limited that, that territory, a wildlife corridor. Wildlife corridors are something we've started to look a lot of in conservation is maintaining these wildlife corridors so animals can move around, right? Um, you know, mountain lions are another one, right? And some of, the, some, of the, some of the animals can kind of overcome it because they can kind of move where they want. Nobody's going to stand at their front gate with a mountain lion coming and say, Whoo, sorry, excuse me, could you go around there, go get Fluffy or Kitty from the next yard. You know, I, I don't want you to eat my Fluffy or my Kitty. So... The, some of the animals can handle this, but others just go away. The one we're pretty sure that goes away locally when we, when we fragment and destroy the habitat is the burrowing owl. Burrowing owls are just disappearing, right? And they're, they're not an endangered species, but they're a listed species. It's one we're really looking at. 
Energy, air, climate, increased energy and use and waste. We've got increased emissions of carbon dioxide and other pollutants. We have decline of downtown business districts when we have this urban sprawl. So locally, people have moved out of downtown Victorville, right? And if you go down downtown Victorville, it's kind of a cute little downtown, actually. It was a part of Route 66. But if you go down through there, you'll notice what? Every third door front, shop front is closed, right? So we, we and, and there's more unemployment in these big central cities, right? So that's urban sprawl. Urbanization has advantage. Um, there's centers for innovation, education, jobs. If we do it right, if we plan properly, we can bring jobs back to these big cities. Downtown LA, if you look at the Staples Center and a bunch of innovation that's going on downtown LA, I have a young friend who's, well, kind of part of our family really, who's an architect. And they've moved back into an apartment right downtown LA because all the work and architects offices and some high tech stuff's moving right back into LA, right into downtown LA because of other issues with urbanization and urban sprawl and, and suburbia is the traffic has just become ridiculous for one thing, right? Price of gasoline's gone up, things like that, okay? So health, you've got access to better medical care. Definitely people who live way out in, in some third world countries move in because they feel like they got better access to social services and medical care and things like that. Environmentally, we get higher funding for recycling program. So if we bring everything together and we plan properly, and you'll see from Dana Armstrong's lecture, we can plan well, and we can start actually doing a really good job of our planning, for example, for uh, recycling programs. And there's a lot of really, really interesting good stuff that's happened locally with that. And it preserves biodiversity. If we concentrate people in areas now we can have more open space, and we can manage that open space better, right? Okay, um, characteristics of cities, not going to get into this. They have huge ecological footprints. They lack vegetation. They have water problems. We've got to bring water into them. Um, this excessive noise. Um, yeah, again, I have no idea. I do know why people <laughs> live in there, in big cities, because I don't think they have choice. But when... People choose to choose to live in a big city. That just amazes me, but it's okay. Right, so really are they sustainable systems? That's kind of what we're talking about. We've got all these inputs, and we've all got a lot of outputs. So it takes a lot of resources to make these things work, right? And so we've talked about a lot of these. I don't think we have to get... But basically we're saying... If we're going to have sustainable urbanizations, we need to balance these systems better, right? So, for example, if you just pick one there, solid waste. How are we going to take the solid waste from a city and manage it better? Well, we're going to recycle, reuse. We're maybe going to put an incinerator in L.A. instead of taking all that solid waste and shipping it out of town. Have you ever thought about where does the solid waste from L.A. go? You guys ever thought about that? In the ocean, yeah, by mistake. A lot does, yeah. A lot of it goes in the ocean. Good, good answer. Um, some of it, do you know that a lot of it comes to the Victor Valley? Did you guys know that? Yeah, so L.A. is kind of progressive in a way. You have to give them some credit. They have a three-can system. They have a green waste not a green container, but a green waste container that can be composted. So it comes up to, um, we're not going on this, this we're not going to see it directly, but you would have seen it in Lynn's class and in the, in the lab, environmental science lab class. There's a place called American Organics down next to Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Authority. Sam knows exactly, if you, no, you were involved, or you were at AQMD. But down, down in Oro Grande where the big, where our big wastewater reclamation uh, facility is, there's American Organics there. It's a big composting facility. And that green waste, yard, food waste, everything else, is coming to that there to be composted. So 
How could we do that better? Well, LA should be composting right in LA. Why are we taking all those transport costs and shipping them out of town? You also heat it up, huh? If you get up some compost here? No, you know, compost heats up automatically. You know, the, bac the bacteria, you put water with it and the bacteria in it, and if you keep turning it and you get the aerobic, good bacteria, it'll, it'll heat up itself. So yes, compost heats it up, but you don't have to add heat to compost, Is that, if that's what you're asking. You don't yeah. have to, but... They don't. They no, don't. No, nobody that I know of is heating compost. If they do it properly, the bacteria, because they're living organisms that are eating up that and decompose, produce their own body heat, which heats the compost, which in turn basically kind of sterilizes it. Compost gets up to 120, 130, 140 degrees, somewhere in that range. So decently hot, and, and it, it basically sterilizes itself if it's done properly, right? And that done properly means it's turned and aerated a lot. So we get the, anaero the aerobic, oxygen using uh, bacteria and microbes in there rather than the anaerobic. And those are the ones that make it stink. So most people would say, well, oh, oh, we're not gonna have a composting facility in LA in my backyard, kind of a NIMBY thing, because it smells. Well, no, actually it doesn't have to smell at all. Actually it can smell kind of good. Because a really good fresh compost smells like good soil, and it smells good. Now, you, maybe not to everyone, but some people. <laughs> what happened, Lynn? Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. Life is desperate struggle for urban people in less developed countries. So we talked about slums, squatter settlements, and shanty towns. Very similar, really. But we, I think. Slum would be a little bit more where things had been done. Terrible living conditions, lack basic water and sanitation. So there is no place to go to the bathroom where the sewerage is going to go anyway. So guess what? It's behind the nearest bush or whatever. Okay? What can governments do to help? Okay, so there's Rio. This is a very, um, what's, the, what's the name they give? They have a... Well, they call it barrios in other parts, but Rio has its own special name for all of this, and it's a whole culture in Rio. It's been going on for years and years and years, and all you see between these buildings, if you pick that green building there, if you can see that, um, all that is just shanty town, cardboard houses, uh, everything, thing. and it was just, this was a big problem at the Olympics, right, the Rio Olympics. Because those folks were demonstrating. They actually said, they actually came out and said, hey, we don't think you should be spending money on these Olympics. That money should be going to us to help us. And they, it was a big problem. They, at, at one point, they, it was bad enough that they thought it would disrupt the Olympics. You guys remember that? World Cup. World Cup. Oh, you know what? It, what? I'll take it back. It was actually the World Cup. Yeah, the most recent... Right, but the World Cup was more recent, slightly more recent, right? Yeah, it's, it was the World Cup. Thank you. Okay, mega cities, severe pollution, water pollution, water availability. What progress is being made? This is Mexico City. Um, cities can grow outward and upward. So compact cities that are growing upward in high rises and stuff. Dispersed cities. We're not so much about tall buildings. That architect, young friend of ours. He's a uh, skyscraper architect. That's his passion. And he works for the largest architect firm in, in the world that does these super tall buildings. And so they're working on, they're starting to design what's going to be the tallest building in L.A. So that's, but so you can go up or sideways. Um, and problem with the other one, if you go sideways, disperse, then you're going to need more motor vehicles and more energy and all of that to transport people, okay? Advantages, use of motor vehicles has advantages and disadvantages. I think we kind of know all of this. Um, we live in, a, in, in the area, so we know all of these things. I don't think we have to go. Of course, it's convenience. I think, I think in our culture, it goes way beyond convenience, though. I think the thing we don't want to admit in here is motor vehicles are a big part of our culture, right? We don't want to drive a nasty old VW butt, right? We want to drive a Dodge Hemi with this 5.3 liter engine 
and or four-wheel drive and the thing's never ever going to see off-road in its life right so it's a cultural thing that that is going on with some of this you know we don't mind getting on the freeway I, I, I'm guessing with these people that are prepared to do this these freeway uh, commutes they we don't mind getting on the freeway and sitting on the two hours as long as we're sitting in a BMW I, I'm not sure what what's going on there I'm like I don't want to sit there even if it's on a bicycle it's crazy okay so Full price pricing, high gasoline taxes. Well, that's happening in California. You guys just noticed recently that gasoline prices went up a lot. Why did they go up? There's new taxes, specifically supposed to be for infrastructure, to build more freeways and make things work better. Okay, So you can do all kinds of things for, for automobiles. I think some of this just happens automatically. Is is Reducing automobile use, um, if I can ride my bicycle, and for example, again, back to that young friend of ours, he can lit he, it would take him, he doesn't even keep a car downtown, but if he had one, it would take him longer to drive to where he works than it does to walk. So these things start coming. And then we also need to encourage transportation alternatives, hybrids, electric, fuel cell, and of course, buses, bicycles, mass transit, Rapid rail, all those kinds of things. Okay, how can cities become more sustainable living? Basically, smart growth. So, a couple of really important, and these ones are kind of important. We reduce the dependence on motor vehicles. That's a huge one. Control and directs that urban sprawl, and we reduce wasteful resource use. So, those are where we focus with smart urban urban growth. Okay. Smart growth tools, this is be important. Um, look for on the final, well, I'm not getting you guys are okay. I don't know if there is one on the final, but we will sometime put on the final. This is a really good little essay question. How, what are some of the tools that can be used for smart growth? So limits and regulations, limit building permits. So some areas are saying we not only do you have to have a building permit, but we're limiting it, right? You don't, we're, we're limiting growth. So up near San Luis Obispo and Solvang, where I was last week, um, that's what some areas are doing. Zoning is huge, right? You can only build um, commercial here. You can only do multifamily housing over here. You can only do uh, residential over here and Zoning is, is, is a huge way to manage this. And so our county, our cities all have land use, uh, land use plans. That in, and zoning is a big piece of that. One of the things that we used a lot when we negotiated and worked with the county on the renewable energy sprawl that was happening, we said, hey, let's come up with special zoning for that. And so the renewable energy projects could only go in certain zones. Okay? Um, ecological land use planning. So we're looking at the ecology. We're making sure we're improving. Yes? Um, what are green belts? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so green belt is literally where in their plan they say, okay, um, so a real example, would good example actually, would be Central Park in Manhattan, right? where you make it, literally make a green belt and you try to connect it. So a lot of people can, oh, you know what the best, how, how many people be to San Francisco? Okay, so that, what do they call it, the Golden Gate Park? That thing is unbelievable. It stretches from downtown San Francisco all the way to the ocean. So you can jump on, anyone basically is close enough to that thing to jump on so when I was there staying with my son last year, I would just walk down there, and then I, now I'm in a green belt. I'm in, in open green area. So it's, a, it's an important uh, tool to make a green belt. It's literally what it is. Let's, let's make parks and, and undeveloped areas that actually connect. Other things would be bike paths and walking paths along a river. That could be a, you know, a used river like L.A. is doing. They're trying to repair their river. So um, eco-cities use solar and other locally available re renewable energy resources. Okay, I should have underlined locally. 
We'd like to see solar put in the city, not out here somewhere else. Put it there where it's close by, that we don't waste energy delivering it there. Designs buildings to be heated and cooled as much as possible by nature. Okay, that would be passive solar or it would be active. What uh, active solar did we talk about at, at, at my house for heating and cooling? Anybody remember? It, not the pool. The pool doesn't count. That's for cooling, but one person at a time. So, no, it was the underground heating of the house, right? I have those, those pipes in the floor. Then I've got water, solar water, thermal collection units that collect the sun's heat, collect it into the water, and then I circulate the floor. Once I get that going, done. Don't ask my wife because she doesn't think that's ever actually going to work because it's not working yet. Use energy and matter resources efficiently, prevent pollution, and reduce waste. Okay? Uh, eco cities, reuse, recycle, compost, municipal waste, we've talked about all that. Protect and encourage biodiversity. So, how the heck do we do it? Do you, do you know that there's a mountain lion living in Griffith Park? That's pretty radical. And they've known about it, and they're watching the guy. I guess they're waiting for him to eat someone. <laughs> it's a male that migrated in there. They don't even know how he got there. It's a young male mountain lion living right in the middle of L.A. You know where Griffith Park is? Yeah. I mean, there's, it's pretty close to the middle of L.A. And so, but you need to encourage that and work with that, right? And, but also conserve. Do you know that they estimate that there are more coyotes in LA and in urban areas than there were in, in, in the natural environment? That's an example of now we need to actually probably manage that and reduce those numbers. Maybe they're too much. Same thing with ravens and crows. They're up to 10, 100 times more than they should be in these areas. Okay? That means we have to manage that. Let's not leave our waste outdoors and my dog food outdoors where they can eat it, okay? LA River Project is a big one. Um, there's a big foundation, the Annenberg Foundation, that's working a lot on this. They're trying to repair, they used to, old school was let's just make concrete. So they concreted the whole LA River pretty much. Now they're going in and taking their concrete up and restoring that area into riparian vegetation, okay? Promote urban gardens, okay? So that would be people have gardens, community gardens, farmers market, and community supported agriculture. Is it, who does not know what community supported agriculture is? Does anybody know what it is? Is it, is it, is it kind of like, um, like where the community all gets together and you create like more environmentally like, connected? For, for agriculture? Yeah, for agriculture. No, not quite. What it is is somebody comes from, there's a guy in, I uh, can't remember the town. I mean, there's very, very, there's several of them. But he's actually done it in, he had a big lot. It's down here in uh, Cucamonga, beyond, out that way. But, forgive me the name of the little town, but the little city, it's part of a big city. But he just took his lot, it was like an acre. And he's made this really intensive Vegetable growing, he's got aquaponics, they're growing fish and all this stuff. And people come and they either contribute money or their time. So it's community supported. So they come and help weed and water and all of that. And then for that, they get basically a box of produce every week or every month or whatever. So it's community supported agriculture, whole communities working on it. And there's several examples. There was one going in Phelan. I haven't heard lately how that's been going. There's several in Redlands, for example. So yeah, that's community supported agriculture. Sorry, Sam, you had a question? No, I'm just saying there was one in LA and they closed it down recently. Oh yeah. Like, was gonna, they were planning to do like a factory or something. Okay. Like so there could also be community support. It also could be a community, uh, a community garden, right? What am I trying to think of? Uh, an actual, that's a little bit different. Community supported agriculture is more of a commercial venture where the community is involved. A community garden would be, they just take an open lot. And we were in, uh, in the, uh, oh man, I can't think of LA cities right now, but 
way out there where Hollywood is. And there was a huge one when we went to a wedding recently. Okay. Uh, Curitiba is just a good case study. Don't have to get into that. Okay. So next stage. Good morning. It was all good. It's all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was just turned off. Thank you. Appreciate it. Working great. So um, solid waste. We've got a little bit of time to talk about this. Um, so now we kind of change gear and just focus in on, on, on solid and hazardous waste. So it's important to look at where solid waste comes from, right? So solid waste, in our general thinking, is our garbage, right? And it could be industrial solid waste, and we'll see in a moment that's like 98% comes from industry. Could be municipal solid waste, which comes from the cities and towns. And then the one we also need to break off from that is hazardous waste, stuff that actually has an effect on our health, right? And that goes back to the lecture we had on, on health and pollution and all that. Uh, what is that? Chapter 11, I think. Okay. Reasons to reduce solid waste are pretty simple but really important. Unnecessary waste of Earth's resources. Everything we throw away, we need to think of, rather than just what are we going to do it and dispose of it, what, what resources did we waste? So every piece of packaging and cardboard we throw away instead of recycling, or if, why did we have to use that in the first place? All right? Unnecessary use of resources. We all know that conservation of the resource is a much cheaper way of recycling, reusing, or substituting for it. Right? And then the pollution and greenhouse gas thing. Okay? So reason for solid waste, it cuts down for reducing it is cuts down air, water pollution, and greenhouse gases. Okay, So um, this is an interesting one. We should go to it now in case we've missed it. Because can you guys think of a way that, to me, that one, like, unless you think about it, why did they put greenhouse gases in here? Because greenhouse gas isn't a solid waste. So, so if we're better at reducing solid wastes, how do we, what's one way that it reduces greenhouse gases? So transportation? Yeah, exactly. So it would be that one thing. And then another one that, that probably has become a massive focus, um, it, well, it's probably, it has become a massive focus, is specifically looking at what kind of waste they are. So we know that municipal waste over 50% of it is green waste. And also, if we know the way we've been disposing of green waste right now, we've just been putting it on the dump. We one of the ways, if you go out, how many people take their waste out to the local dump? Victorville. Cool. It's a good educational thing to do because you see how much stuff we're throwing away. But if you notice, they'll, those big those big uh, bulldozers will compact it down and all that, move it around, and then they'll come over the top with what looks like mulch. It's green waste. Okay, it looks like mulch. And that kind of holds it down and prevents it from all blowing away and all that kind of stuff. Well, that green waste, as it gets deeper, starts to decompose anaerobically. There's no aerobic air-using microbes that are feeding on it, and it starts to produce methane, CH4. Methane is a fuel, so if we crap that, it would be good. But that's all going back up into the atmosphere. And methane is 30 times, 25 to 30 times better greenhouse gas, or worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So methane, 30 times worse. So if we reduce green waste from going from going into the dump in the first place, we put it into composting, we, we have this massive saving in greenhouse gases. Okay, just by something that's very doable. So that's why composting and vermiculture. How many people know what vermiculture is? Sam, Sam what is vermiculture? Use worms. worms. Use worms to, they've come over to the department right now, we just did a little class on that. We've got a couple of vermiculture demonstrations going. Worms, especially it's these little uh, red California worms, are decomposing this stuff and making this wonderful compost, right? <laughs> it's 
So, guess what? We're a leader. Did you guys know we're a leader? We are the world leader in several things that we shouldn't be. So we're the leader in producing solid waste. That's not good. That's ridiculous. Come on. That's ridiculous. Industrial solid waste comprises 98.5%. There's that figure. Municipal waste is only 1.5. So most of this emphasis here immediately looks at, OK, our regulations, our focus, <clears throat> everything should be on the industry side of the house. Okay? And that's where we have a lot of play. That's where we have a play as a consumer. So let me give you an example of Interface, which is the famous carpet company that went to zero uh, carbon uh, footprint, right? And they recycle their, their carpet. You'll know it's their carpet because it's always in squares. It's much more expensive, but it's always in squares. We actually have some on campus up above. And when it's done, they pick up those squares and they ship it to wherever the nearest interface carpet factory is, and they recycle it. Okay? And th so that's an example of industrial focus on the industrial area. But we can also do that through by saying, OK, and I almost did this. I, don't, I would do this, but I don't have any carpet in my house. I wouldn't buy a carpet for my house from any other place than somebody who does that. So now I can say, OK, let's promote that, because I'm not going to buy a product that from a company that doesn't think like that. Okay? So that would be it working in the industrialized solid waste zone. Okay? Average weight of, of municipal per person has leveled off. So we're actually doing a decent job. It's leveled off because of re -like, recycling, lighter weight products, and reduced product packaging. All right, I'm not getting that one. Okay? I love to go to, I always forget the name, but the the supermarket that's right over there, Winco, because they have bulk stuff, right? So I can buy the rabbit food that I eat for breakfast, you know, all the different grains and all that, um, straight there, and I don't, there isn't a whole bunch of packaging, right? If you buy a package of cornflakes, it comes in a, in a cardboard packet and then another packet in there. What the heck is that about? What? What? Why? Come on. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. So, now, harmful chemicals or hazardous waste, it's a huge amount we can do, right? How many people still know somebody that changes the motor oil in their car and then just goes and buries it in the desert? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I do. I know someone. It's not me, but I know someone. It's one of our ex-students. I'm still working with him to try to figure that out. He, and he does work on our vehicles. So, but but we, I was having that discussion with him the other day. And he says no, but I'm not sure that he's reformed yet or not. Okay. So gasoline, flea powder, I mean, all this stuff. Batteries are huge. They're very, very nasty, right? and all the other stuff that we use, right? We love one of my favorite ridiculous practices is moms especially that want to go right behind their kid or in front of their kid spraying with disinfectant everywhere. And it's clearly proved that that does absolutely nothing. Do you know that if you spray, and I did a research on this in a different environment, we won't go into that, um, but if you spray alcohol on that table, it takes 20 minutes for it to have an effective uh, uh, disinfectant effect on whatever bacteria is there. So that pure, what is it called, Purell, those little things that they go, absolutely ridiculous. And plus, then the kids aren't immune to anything, and first time a decent bug comes along, it really hurts them. So anyway. But there's an example. We're using all the stuff in our houses. So we need to really look at why we're using it and how we can use it less of it and how we can recycle and reuse it. Okay? Uh, fastest growing solid waste is electronic waste. I would say, yeah, worldwide. But green waste is our most pressing problem in, in the United States. We take our electronic waste and mostly ship it to other countries 
for them to try to recycle it or dump it, right? Okay, um, <clears throat> the other thing about what's interesting about electronic waste is they're incredibly valuable um, minerals that are in all of that stuff, right? Things like cadmium and rare earth minerals that are very, very um, hard and, and, and we don't have really good sources for anymore. So that's why recycling electronic waste is also so important. And you always want to look at when you're recycling and reusing something, you want to get the maximum benefit. That's why I love green waste, because you take it out of the system, you reduce this greenhouse, you have this massive greenhouse waste, greenhouse gas effect, and then you can use it as a fertilizer to grow more food. I mean, it's an you want to look at all the benefits in the cycle of recycling. And this one, again, has huge benefits. And it's economically viable if it's done properly. And that's what Dana will talk to you about or you should ask her about is when they have the local materials recycling facility, they, they really want to focus and like the things that are economically viable. So, so um, if you recycle aluminum cans, they are economically sustainable because they make a profit. Right, recycling some other things like cardboard, depending on the market, takes more effort to recycle the cardboard than you get paid for it. We're still going to do it because we're mandated to do it, but it takes more effort. Right? It, it, it's, it doesn't have more beneficial effects. Okay, okay so uh, how do we, what should we do with solid waste? We should burn. We can burn or bury solid waste or produce less of it. We can reduce uh, waste management. We can reduce, reduce harm but not amounts. Waste reduction, we can use less. We can re we've talked about all this. Only thing I really wanted to talk to you guys about here is something, a word and thinking that you need to talk about. We talked about integrated pest management when we talked about using pesticides better. Well, in this game, they talk about integrated waste management we use a bunch of different things to get the job done, not just, for example, recycling, okay? Um, and with integrated waste management, you'll start to hear them talk about zero waste. And obviously, we all know that zero waste is, is, is not possible, right? But the concept is there. So with a company like Interface, they're going towards a zero waste model, right? Um, but, um, and, and so they think like, how can we get this to be zero waste? In other words, whatever we use is repurposed, recycled, reused, and, um, and or has this other, these other beneficial effects. Okay, so this is, oh, that slide didn't come out very well, but I'll fix that. But integrated waste management, if you guys can't really see this, but so how do we do this um, in, in case it, it, when we're looking at hazardous waste? We can produce less hazardous waste. So we can change industrial processes to reduce or eliminate hazardous waste production. Okay, so you, local example of this from way back, we used to use cyanide uh, and mercury to get gold out of gold ore. Well, they don't do that anymore. They have other processes, okay? Recycle and reduce the hazardous waste. We can convert, we can, we can convert less hazardous waste to non-hazardous substances, okay? So we can, we can convert them. I, I can't give you an exact example. And we can put it into perpetual storage, okay? So, this would be like nuclear waste. If we would, as a society, approve the Yucca Mountain project in, in uh, Nevada, up the road from here, we could take nuclear waste and we could take it out of the system. We could bury it underground in these big concrete vaults. And then we, in my opinion, could make a much better case for using nuclear power. I, I actually, as far as I know, as much about nuclear power and you guys should watch that, that video that we have by Tony Penner that's on, on, on Blackboard. Nuclear power is a valid option, OK? 
Okay, but we've got to be able to store the the nuclear waste. We can't have it to this day sitting on our coastline at San Onofre in these big above ground pools that they have all that waste sitting. We've got to get it out of the way to where if there was an earthquake or whatever or somebody dropped a bomb on San Onofre, all that low grade nuclear waste wouldn't go out into all the urban people that live around there and into the ocean. Okay. Okay, so we're almost got a few more minutes, right, Lynn? We can cut cars where we've talked about this. You guys can learn. So here's, I think, the best place to stop because, again, we've talked about back to the sustainability flow, right? We are, we are going to, in environmental sciences and sustain, we know we have to use these things. We have to use these resources. We're going to have natural capital degradation. We're going to come up with solutions, like let's just think of composting, okay? And then find, and they're going to have to be trade-offs. I remember, you guys are probably not old enough, but most of you, sorry, I'm looking around for any old people. So over in Atlanta, big stink, not too long ago, from a company called Nursery Products. It wasn't a very good operator. But they put a, nurse, a, a big composting facility right in Atalanto. And the people came up in arms um, because they weren't prepared to make that trade-off. They didn't understand the value of that as opposed to, hey, I don't want flies or stink in my backyard. Okay? And then finally, what's the final thing? Individuals matter, you remember? It's that responsibility of us stepping in and saying, what can I do? So these slides in all the things are really key. What can you do? You can use the four R's. You can be careful what you buy. You can go to Winco and buy everything from <clears throat> rice and all sorts of things in bulk and in just a few little plastic uh, contain, uh, packets that can be reused. You can rent or barter uh, goods and services, uh, buy products with little or no packaging, avoid disposables, paper and plastic bags, plates and cups, okay? cook with whole fresh food, avoid heavily packaged processed foods, discontinue junk mail, right? So we've got all this technology and you guys are really, it's a place where you guys can really make a difference because you want to get your information electronically. You don't need to get a newspaper or whatever else it is, okay? So I think that probably, let's see what the next slide is. That's probably a good place to stop. Kind of goes into what can you do. So then it also talks about a little more depth about, you know, what... Where are we doing the most? So recycling pack plastics, which is a huge problem, we're only recycling 7%. So obviously, we need to do a better job there. Okay? Uh, we can copy nature and recycle biodegradable solid waste. <clears throat> so again, what are we doing? What's the principle? We're mimicking nature. We're using in the natural cycles. This is the natural carbon cycle, mostly, but it's also part of the natural nitrogen cycle, okay? Uh, ways the, the, the topsoil is used, organic soil fertilizer, topsoil, and a landfill cover, okay? So yes, we can still use it to a certain extent in landfills, but let's make sure we go here first. Locally, we actually have a huge problem. This is where I will end, make it local. Um, the legislation that is coming in that will preclude <coughs> um, AVCO and, and I can't think of the other, the big companies that are collecting our solid waste, that will preclude them from putting green waste on the dumps is only two years away. And they're starting to ramp up pressure on these folks. And so the one that I'm most familiar is because we visited it last year with my RCD group, our directors we visited, is up in, in Asperia. And what they're doing is they're starting to pull off 
the green waste, but the green waste is highly contaminated with broken glass and plastic and all of this. And they're not recycling, they're not composting it, and it's not clean enough to compost actually. And so they've got this problem. So they started to pay people, which really got our attention, and we've, we were starting to put some serious pressure on them not to do this, but they basically started to pay people to basically dump it on their land. And so there were people out in Lucent Valley and some people that were poorly educated that thought it would be good for a mulch, for, for jujubes, for example, um, and they've literally dumped up to two feet of the stuff on properties in Lucent Valley. I don't know any, anyone's really locally here. And obviously, that's not a viable solution. So this is a, the actual composting itself is where they have to go. Okay. All right. Okay, I think that's good. Thank you very much.